As uh, Carl said, Phil Windley, I'm in the CIO's office over at BYU. Um, and I'm also the chairman of something called the Sovereign Foundation. Um, Sovereign is building a public, global, decentralized identity platform. Uh, uses a distributed ledger, I'll talk more about that later. I've got a few slides to kind of introduce the concept of self-sovereign identity and how Sovereign does that, but then I think there'll be time afterwards for any detailed questions that you wanted to ask. Um, so I want to speak about self-sovereign identity and its relationship to trust. The, I don't think I have to go very far, especially on a day where Equifax lost 143 million identities to convince you that identity online is broken. There are too many anti-patterns, but even more than the security problems that come up, I think we're losing opportunities to create business because of the friction that we introduce through identity. This cartoon is famous. It's the most reproduced uh, New Yorker cartoon ever. Uh, the caption says, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Um, as Carl mentioned, I founded, along with Kalia Hamlin and Doc Searles, the Internet Identity Workshop back in 2005. We will hold our 25th meeting this October. We established the Internet Identity Workshop with the goal of creating what we called user-centric identity at the time, something that was about users. And Internet Identity Workshop has been the home of things like OpenID and OAuth and OAuth Connect and user-managed access and a lot of interesting protocols that have come about that have advanced the cause of user centricity online. There, but it hasn't been enough. It hasn't been the same as creating self-sovereign identity. Um, despite a quarter century of advances in online identity, there's still no good way for you to prove that you're human or that you're over 18 or that you work at a certain place or that you have a bank account with a balance of at least some certain amount. All of these things are really hard to do online. And that's because it's really hard online to get anybody to believe what you say. And it's almost impossible to reliably get somebody else to vouch for you in a way that is frictionless and you can just work, make work. Now, we can ask the question, why do we build identity systems? And I believe the answer is trust. We believe we build identity systems in order to create trust. So when we create an authorization system, for example, we're trying to make sure that we can trust that the person at the other end of the connection is the same person that created the account, or at least knows the same credentials, right? But what we'd like to know is that they're the same person that created the account. Now, trust used to be something that was local. It was about the people you knew, the people you dealt with every day, and how you interacted with them. And it turns out people have a really, really excellent decentralized identity system built into them. Why? We recognize people's faces. We remember their names. We remember that they cheated us last time or that they gave us a little extra and we appreciated that. We're really good at identity, but we're not really good at translating those ideas about identity into the online systems that we create. Now, what we did as the world got bigger and as we started having to interact more with strangers is we created systems that would allow us to trust strangers. And those systems are the things we're familiar with, things like banks and schools and governments are all institutions that intermediate our interactions with other people. There goes the GPU. It's going to come back. There it is intermediate our interactions with people so that we can have a trustworthy relationship, so we can trust what we're doing with them. Now, believing people online is difficult because online we lack the context that we need in order to create trust around an identifier. So it's about context and it's about the things that we can say about an identifier 
that allow us to create trust around it. Now, when somebody like Amazon builds an identity system, they're doing that in order to create trust, specifically that they know who they're dealing with on the other end, and that they have certain attributes, and that they've done certain things. They want to know about you. And we call these kinds of, tr of, these kinds of uh, identity systems trust frameworks. These are simple trust frameworks. Um, and they're centralized. They're owned by a particular company, Amazon in this case. They are private, right? They're built for a particular purpose, for Amazon's purpose. We call these administrative identity systems because they're built to administer identity within a specific domain. Amazon can change the terms at any point, and you have no recourse. If Amazon decides tomorrow to take your ID away from you, believe me, it will not be pleasant. And it will be very hard to get it back. I've had a friend that had that happen to them. And that's Amazon's right. They built the identity system. They're the ones that gave you an identifier. But don't ever believe that you have an identity at Amazon that belongs to you in any way. It's all about Amazon and what they want to do. Now, these kinds of simple trust frameworks are useful for establishing trust within a single domain. We also build trust frameworks that allow us to create trust across domains. Maybe the best known example of this is Visa. You have a contract with your bank. Maverick down here has a contract with their bank, probably not the same bank. And yet you can walk into Maverick with a credit card from your bank give it to the people at Maverick, and they can take the identifier off of it, the number, and believe that at the end of the day, money is going to show up in their account. Why? They don't have any relationship with you, and in fact, you don't even have a relationship with the same bank. It was because Visa has created a federation. They've created an overarching trust framework that consists of three parts. There are business rules, there are legal frameworks, legal contracts, and there's technology. We call this the BLT sandwich of trust. Okay. And, they, and this BLT sandwich allows Visa to create trust among a billion people and how they ch exchange money. That's quite, a, that's quite a system. Now, these are also centralized. Right? Visa owns this trust framework. Now, it turns out that it's distributed right? and that it, is, that it includes a lot of different people. But it's still a single place built for a single purpose. And Visa doesn't really allow just anybody to come in and use their system to do whatever they want. Right? They'll sell you service to do what they want, but that's about it. Now, there are other examples of this kind of trust framework. So any federation, for example, if you can log into your health uh, insurance provider using your employer's, uh, your employer's ID. Right? That's an example of a federation. Airbnb, Lyft, Uber, Blah Blah Car, these are all examples of federated trust frameworks where they're bringing multiple people together and creating trust among these different people in order to do something, right? make you uh, able to get a ride somewhere or rent an apartment or whatever. Now, in the real world, it doesn't work like this. We don't have trust frameworks the same way that we do online. You don't have to log into the restaurant's administrative ID system in order to have a conversation with your friend over dinner. But that's not how the real world works. How does it work? Well, you do it all the time, right? You walk into a pharmacy, and they say, oh, to fill this prescription, you need to be over 18. And what do you do? You give them a driver's license. Now, they take this driver's license. Now, I used to be the CIO for the state of Utah. And the Division of Public Safety in Utah, that's who issues your driver's license. The Division of Public Safety does not believe that they are creating an identity document for pharmacies. It's not why they do it. Right? They've created an identity document for a specific domain, driving cars, but yet you're able to take that identity document and use it somewhere else. Why does that work? It works because of two things. 
One, most people trust that the Division of Public Safety is going to do a reasonable job of determining that you have a specific birthday. The second thing is the driver's license is reasonably difficult to forge. So the pharmacist can look at it and determine, yeah, this feels like a real Utah driver's license. They can look at the date and say, yeah, that's more than 18 years ago, so this person can fill this prescription. Notice that at no time did the pharmacy have to call the Division of Public Safety. Their systems didn't have to have any kind of API integration with the Division of Public Safety. They can decide tomorrow that they're going to start taking driver's licenses for a particular purpose. That's all they need to do. They're up and running. Very frictionless. No API integrations, no commercial relationship, no contractual relationship, not even a technology relationship other than just the ability that people have to look at a driver's license and use the sophisticated biometric identity system on it called a picture to determine that it's really yours. So this is a very simple frictionless system. Now identity professionals call the attributes that are on a driver's license claims. Okay, so I'm going to use that word a lot today. I'm going to use, talk about claims. When I talk about claims, just think about the birthday or the address or the name. All of those are claims on the driver's license. So let's talk about something called a verifiable claim. There is a W3C standard, emerging standard, it's not a standard yet, called the verifiable claim standard. And Verifiable claims allow us to do digitally the same kind of thing that we do um, at the pharmacy with our driver's license. So my employer, BYU for example, could issue a claim, a JSON document that has been signed in a specific way. That's really all we're talking about. It has certain attributes in it. They could give it to me. I could take that same thing to my bank and use it to prove at my bank that I work for BYU. And I wouldn't have to have any kind of relationship between the bank and BYU for this to work. That's the idea of a verifiable claim. Now, verifiable claims have four really important properties. First, they're decentralized and contextual. Think about the driver's license, for example. It's completely decentralized. Everybody just carries it around with them. There's no central API that you have to log into to do it. And um, anybody can be an issuer or a owner or a verifier of a digital claim, a verifiable claim. Anybody can issue one of these. Anybody can verify them. Anyone can be the holder of one of these things. The second thing that is really important is this thing we talked about earlier, that the verifier doesn't have to have any kind of relationship with the issuer. Not commercial, contractual, or technical. The third thing that's really important is that verifiers make their own trust decisions about what credentials they're going to accept. So the pharmacy might say, yeah, we take driver's licenses. We're also happy to take a passport. If you want to bring in your birth certificate, we'll take that. The, the, the pharmacy can make that decision. There's no overarching authority that's saying, oh, if you want to verify birthdays, here's the credential you need. Every individual verifier makes their own decision about what they want to do. And the fourth thing that's important is that the credential carrier, the claim owner, is free to carry any credentials you want. We do that all the time, right? You bought a wallet with you somewhere. You chose what documents, what credentials you're going to put in this wallet. How did you make that determination? You call up the government and say, what credentials do I have to carry around? No, you just figured out, well, OK, I probably need these credit cards and this driver's license, and oh, I need my BYU ID. And you just figured out what you need to carry. And tomorrow, you could decide to carry something else or stop carrying a certain credit card. Nobody tells you what to do. Now, Sovereign supports verifiable claims natively, so they're built in. So when you use Sovereign, you just get verifiable claims. There are three things that make Sovereign work. The first is a distributed ledger. Okay, so that's why I'm here at a blockchain thing, right? It's because there's a blockchain thing in Sovereign. 
Um, the distributed ledger is global and it's public. Public means that anybody can use it. It doesn't, you don't have to have prior permission from, from Sovereign to, to use it. Um, there we go. Yeah. Um, now, Sovereign's ledger is a public, but it is permissioned. So it is not a permissionless ledger. It has a known set of validator nodes. The validators don't make decisions about what transactions can happen. They just achieve consensus on the ledger. Now, you might say, well, why don't you use the Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain or some other permissionless ledger? There's a very good reason. The reason is because we want transactions to be extremely cheap, and I'll tell you why in a second. Second part that makes this work is something called a decentralized identifier. There's an emerging specification for decentralized identifiers. We call them DIDs. DIDs allow us to create a pairwise pseudonymous relationship for everybody you interact with. That's why, these rela these, that's why writing things on the ledger has to be really cheap. Because if it costs money, you're going to be tempted to use the same identifier for two different relationships. Because after all, why spend that 45 cents to create a new one or whatever it costs, right? Here's the problem with that. The lights go out when you do that. No. Uh, Why well, well, you brought a lamp. <laughs> this is this is a this is this is a control company. Yeah. So, here's why that matters. Think about what happened today with Equifax. Why do you care that Equifax lost 143 million identities? Because one of them is yours, and what? And that social security number is used. Your social security number is in it, and your credit cards are in it, and those are used everywhere. In other words, the identifiers that we use in systems like social security are universal, right? They're universal identifiers. Social security number is a universal identifier. If I know your social security number, I can correlate activities that you undertake all over the place. Because all I have to know is your social security number and I can start correlating what you're doing. This is why a universal health ID is a really bad idea. Because it's just another social security number. What Sovereign does is it creates pairwise pseudonymous identifiers to prevent correlation. So no two relationships that you have are using the same identifier. That means that two parties can't correlate information about you behind your back based on the Sovereign identifier. Now, if you give them your cell phone number, they're back in business. Your cell phone number is probably the worst universal identifier that you have. Now, DIDs are just a string of digits. In fact, it's a cryptonym that is derived from a elliptic curve uh, public-private key pair. Okay? Um, the DID is written to the ledger. What it's associated with is something called a DDO, a DID descriptor object, a signed JSON LD document that is written to the ledger and contains the public key for this DID and one or more endpoints and several other things which aren't important for our discussion tonight. So DIDs get written to the ledger along with DDOs that contain public keys associated with a DID. So if you give me your DID and I give you my DID, in fact, we're going to create new ones, right? When, when, we want to, when we want to create a relationship, we're going to create new DIDs for each other. We're going to exchange them. And now you can use that DID to look up on the Sovereign Ledger a public key for me. And you can start exchanging private messages, for example. Or you could use it to log me into your system or lots of other things. Now the third thing is this idea we talked about of verifiable claims. So verifiable claims, as we talked about, allow third parties to provide identity information about you that you can take somewhere else and use to, um, to prove in a trustworthy way some attribute that, you, that this third party is claiming. Now let's talk about the idea of self-sovereignty. 
This is a word that sometimes makes people nervous. Not so much in the U.S., but when, when I go speak in Europe, there's a lot of kind of, ooh, sovereign. There, there are some countries that don't want to hear about sovereign individuals. Right? Um, but sovereign is misunderstood. Some people think that when you are sovereign, that means that you have complete control. Well, that's only true if you live alone on an island. Because actually what sovereignty, talk, sovereignty is all about is borders. Think about a sovereign country. What does a sovereign country have? A sovereign country has borders. And within those borders, the country has a monopoly on violence. And outside of those borders, it does not. You cannot engage in violent actions outside of your borders without calling it a war, right? But you can inside your borders. We call those police actions, and they happen all the time. That's what sovereignty means for a country. It's about the border. Same thing's true when we talk about self-sovereign identity. Sovereignty is about the border around the individual, within which the individual has complete control over what identity information they carry, what identity information they share, and outside of which they have to interact with other entities as peers. That's what self-sovereignty means. Um, sovereign clearly defines boundaries over, which individual, over the things that individuals have control of and the things that they have to relate to other people as peers about. Now, it would be silly for us to build a global public identity system that doesn't have privacy built in. We've talked about some of the privacy enhancing features of Sovereign, particularly this idea of DIDs that are pairwise and pseudonymous so that we can avoid correlation. Um, that's the first and important idea. Second idea is that we never write personal information to the ledger, ever, even in encrypted form. So if it's private, it doesn't go on the ledger. Rather, private information is kept in online agents who can intermediate the access to that data. So DIDs get written to the ledger, private information does not. The third thing is something that goes along with verifiable claims. Now earlier I talked about the fact that you could use a verifiable claim, go into an online pharmacy, for example, and prove that you're over 18. But actually, you don't want to give them the claim um, because the claim might have a lot of information. It might not just have the, your birthday. It might have your name, your address. might have driving information. The claim could have all kinds of stuff in it. You don't want to just give that to somebody and let them have it all. So what we have built, baked into Sovereign is the idea of zero-knowledge proofs. So that when you give a claim to someone, you're not really giving them the claim. What you're giving them is a proof based on the claim that they can validate is true and proves whatever information you're trying to share with them. So you go to an online pharmacy, you can give them a zero knowledge proof that you're over 18. They don't get to see your birthday, they don't get to see your address, they don't get to see anything else. You go to the bank and they want to know that you're employed by BYU, you give them a zero knowledge proof that just includes the proof of information that you work at BYU doesn't include anything else, like your employee number or any other information that might be in that claim. Now, one of the magic things, at least for me, it feels like magic, about zero-knowledge proofs is that think about what I just talked about with pairwise pseudonymous identifiers. BYU has one identifier for me, and I'm going to go into my bank who has a different identifier for me, and I need to prove to them that BYU said that I work at BYU. Well, if I give them the identifier that they know me as, BYU doesn't know that identifier. If I give them the identifier that BYU knows me as, they don't know that identifier. Zero-knowledge proofs not only prove the information that you want to transfer, but they also prove that the same person is in control of both of those identifiers without divulging the ones that you don't want them to know. So it's a very cool way of creating privacy around identity data. So yes. Because the, because the proof, 
does contain personal information, right? It proves that I'm over 18, that might be personal, or it might prove that I have a certain salary, for example. And I'm proving some bit of information, I'm just not giving it all away. So I am divulging private information, so I don't want to put that on the ledger, I want to just give that to the person who needs it. It also helps with forward secrecy. Say that louder, sorry. It also helps with forward secrecy. Explain what you mean by that. Yeah, you're talking about not putting it on a ledger. Yeah, not, yeah. Not, not putting it on a ledger saves you from problems with you know people coming up with quantum computing so, and. So who holds the event of personal information? You mentioned some sort of. An agent. Agent. But, yeah, but and agents are defined in the sovereign architecture and are portable and substitutable, so you can choose who your who your agency is, who controls your who holds your private data for you. Now, they can't see your private information either, but it's not on a public blockchain where everybody can go look at it. Um, so we talked about trust frameworks. This idea of Airbnb, for example, is a trust framework. Airbnb is a trust framework, but it's built for a specific purpose. And if you wanted to build a business that needed to connect people, You'd have to go build your own trust framework. But with Sovereign, what Sovereign does is it provides you with a lot of the infrastructure ahead of time so that you don't have to do as much work in order to create trust between parties. And it's one of the reasons why I think that the world needs this kind of public identity utility. Because I think it's going to unleash a lot of activity, economic activity, that previously has been too hard because there's been too much friction too hard to share data, but also too hard to build a business that requires trust. Um, so in addition, I put this slide in because a lot of times I, I speak uh, in uh, countries in the European Union where GDPR is a big deal. Have you heard of GDPR? Global Data Protection um, Regulation. Essentially on May 25th of 2018, GDPR will go into an effect and it um, has pretty big teeth, like, I, for, I forget the exact numbers, but Equifax would be out of business at this point if, G, if they were subject to GDPR, because the European Union would slam them with hefty fines, and fines that are significant. Sovereign helped companies solve the GDPR problem because it automatically records claims but it also automatically records consent receipts about how those claims were used and who agreed to share what with whom and under what conditions that sharing happened. So this automatic idea of consent receipts is an important one. The other thing that's important um, in the, a system like this is revocation. So if I give you a claim that says you work at BYU and then tomorrow you don't work at BYU, I don't want you using that claim next month to tell somebody you work at BYU, so I need to be able to revoke that. So that's another important part of this. Yeah? Is this essentially like an audit trail for traceability of what claims were provided or proven? Yeah, it's an audit trail. That, it's not a public audit trail. Both sides get this auditable data so that they know what was shared with them and you know what you shared. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? Another question? No, I said that was a great oh. question. So um, let's talk about some of the business cases. The first and most obvious one, kind of table stakes, is you have to be able to solve authentication. Okay. Sovereign gets rid of passwords. Right. With, with a sovereign system, there are no username passwords. Uh, once the other system has your DID, they can look up a public key, they can use that public key and their private key to sign a nonce, they can send that to you, you can you know, sign it, send it back, and they now know that whoever they're talking to is the person that, is in, that has control of the private key associated with the DID that you gave them. Right? They can ask you for claims about information, they can then create an account, associate that account with the DID. Essentially, there's no passwords in this system because you're using public-private key cryptography. Now, we've been able to do that for 40 years, but what we haven't been able to do is easily look up the public key associated with someone's identity. And that's what the, that's what the distributed ledger allows us to do, is to have a decentralized way of discovering the public keys associated with the DID. Question for you. Yeah. 
How do you protect the private keys, or how do you secure your private keys? Yeah, so private keys are going to be in something that the user owns or controls, probably a phone, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways of doing key recovery that are based on N of M sharding techniques and that sort of thing. So those are pretty standard techniques. Those aren't necessarily things that Sovereign invented, but they're, they're known ways of, of doing this. But yeah, you would have an app on your phone. You'd have a Sovereign app on your phone that essentially is controlling the public keys that are associated, I'm sorry, the private keys associated with the DIDs you've created. And then if they lose their private keys, then you can recover There's a key recovery mechanism, yeah. Yeah. So when somebody receives this request to be able to verify um, or, or to be able to give your, is it your DID, how do you know that the other party you, you, you can trust? Is there some sort of uh, uh, body that authenticates the new, new users on the system, or how does that work? So How do I know I'm getting the, the request from the right person? So be more specific about what you want to trust. Because I could make some stuff up, but I want to know what you're thinking about. So um, that the entity that's asking to verify um, how, um, how old I am or this, my social or specific health information yeah. is, is the actual entity that, that I initially tried to log in with, right? Yeah, so this is, this is a web of trust problem, right? So how do you know that today? Well, the way you'd know that today, right, is you'd look for the little lock on your browser if you're... Um, educated enough to know sure. to look for the lock on your browser. And why does that lock on the browser work? It works because there's a hierarchical certificate system. Right? So in a sovereign world, there's not a hierarchy of certificates. Rather, there is a web of trust. It's based on people signing each other's certificates, right? kind of like key signing party, but all remote and digital. Um, so let's say, for example, that you show up at a website that purports to be BYU. How do you know it's really BYU? Well, you could know it from a couple of ways. You could just use the fallback on the standard system of saying, oh, well, there's a lock, and I look at the certificate, and yeah, BYU has, owns the certificate. You could do that. Right? You could also, and how would you know what their DID was? Well, they might have a well-known, right, the, the well-known location, dot well-known. Right? You guys know about that? Um, in um, there's a IETF standard RFC. Don't know the number for well known, and there is a standard way of putting well known information on a website. So you, you could have a well known location for DIDs, and now if I'm at a website that I know Amazon, BYU, State of Utah, whatever, I would use that well known information to discover their DID. That's how I would know when they you know sent me something that I was talking to them. So another way is that you could have multiple people claim or create claims that this is really the entity you want to talk to. So you could imagine that your children's school, for example, how do you know that the DID you've got is from your children's school? Because all your neighbors say it is. How do you know they said that? Well, you could call them up, but you're probably just going to have claims from them or proofs from them that say, yeah, this is the DID I use when I talk to Aspen Elementary or whatever. There's various ways that you could do that, but it's much more decentralized than the current hierarchical system that we use today. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, if it's so decentralized and it, and it relies on that web of, of trust, I mean, really, a key aspect of that are going to be these nodes, right? These validators, and, and, and who are they, and how many are they that, that are... That are that yeah, so the validators, the validators are not necessarily validating that certain DIDs belong to certain people. Right? The validators are doing um, consensus transactions to ensure that the distributed ledger has only the transactions on it that everybody has agreed to. They don't even know what's in the transactions. Right? So, it's, so, it's, so, so, they're, so they're not necessarily part of this. Now, you can imagine that there are... Say that again? A malicious validator could then um, try and, and pretend that people They, they could, but the way the distributed consensus protocol works, just like in other sure. blockchains, is you would have to have, uh, I think in the case of Plenum, which is the sovereign uh, distributed ledger system, you'd have to have at least a third of the nodes colluding to do that. Right? So who are they? There are organizations that have a legal contractual relationship with Sovereign Foundation. And they're watching each other, and when they start misbehaving, they would get taken offline. So, so 
we're, we're, that 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 problem, I'm fairly certain we can we can get around. So can you go deeper into what you just said regarding the like, sorry the incentive structure, like the game theory? What is the incentive? These there's no there's no incentive. This is a permissioned network, right? So these validators are they're not doing proof of work. They're not doing proof of stake. Right, but yeah. there has to be some economic incentive. Yeah. So why why do they want to be why do they want to be a validator node? Some of them because it's a good thing to do, right? It does it actually is not that expensive in terms of computational power. But I believe that the reason you want to be a validator node is because you get first crack at the ledger, right? You've got a node that is right on the ledger. You've got a complete copy of the ledger. And there's some business advantage to having the ledger uh, right there. So that's, that's the real advantage. Yeah. So who's the governing body that? Sovereign, sovereign. Foundation. So, okay. So could it be, so they're basically the ones who control the whole Control is probably too strong a word. What would be the right word? They're the, I, I like to think of it as having stewardship over it. Um, certainly, they're the ones who are writing the code, right? Running the open source project. By the way, Sovereign's code is all part of the Hyperledger Indie project. We, we contributed the code for Hyperledger Indie. Um, they're, so, so obviously, they have control over the code. They are also creating the legal contracts that the validator nodes are entering into. Now, why should you trust any of this? The same reason you trust code anywhere, or the same reason you trust anything, because it's open and transparent. So you look at the legal contracts, you can look at the code, you can figure out whether somebody's trying to collude behind your back to do something strange with your identity. Right, so, so that's the trustworthiness of it, is that it's about the openness and the transparency uh, of, of how the system works. Yeah? But does each claim label what category it is? Like, this is the data for ah. this is the... So, so yeah, that's a, that's a slightly different question than the governance question, but that's a good one. So every claim has a link to a schema, and the schema are written on the ledger, and the claim, the claim schema tells you what the claim is about and what the fields mean. And the important thing there is that there's not some canonical set of claim schema that Sovereign has put, put together. Anybody can create a claim schema and write it onto the ledger so and then the website, use that claim. How does the website know when you've given enough information to trust that it's being a real person and not a bot? Um, so how does Amazon know to trust you when you go and create an account? Right? Same, rate, same way. CAPTCHA. <laughs> yeah, CAPTCHA or something else. Same way. Right? I mean, so, yeah, I just, sorry, I just had a, kind of a comment about how, you know, to your question earlier about if you go to like byu.edu, how do I trust that that's really byu if I want to provide them a claim? Um, one way that you might accomplish that is through extended validation, like the EV certificates that are issued with SSL certificates that some banks have where they provide extended attributes um, that verify that, hey, this is Brigham Young University and this is its address. Uh, but that also assumes that you trust the SSL certificate yeah. system, which is in itself has its own problems. Yeah. So, so Sovereign actually has its own way of doing that. I mean, essentially, a DID and DDO is a certificate. That's what it is. Now, why do you believe it? Well, you're going to believe it because of the things that are written or said about it by other entities who you know or trust, right? So Sovereign doesn't try to create trust around every situation because that's out of scope for Sovereign. What Sovereign does is provide the mechanisms by which you can create trust around a certain entity so, or a certain situation or scenario. So if you were, for example, trying to create a, um, an identity system that was great for people who were interested in NFL, right? you could create your own way of how that trust works. What Sovereign does is provide you all the mechanisms for doing that and guarantees that those mechanisms will work. What you have to do is figure out, well, now why do these people trust each other? Why are they going to play games with each other? That's your business problem, and you have to use Sovereign to solve that business problem. Right? But the certificates, a DDO is essentially a certificate. And we have um, one public uh, um, certificate, or certificate 
what are they called? People who issue certificates, companies. Certificate authority. Certificate authority, yeah. So, so InfoCert is an Italian certificate authority who's becoming a sovereign steward. And um, there's another one who you would know if I mentioned their name who is actively looking at it. So why are certificate authorities looking at this? Well, I, I think it's because they see it's a new way of doing this and they just want to extend their business. Sam, you had a comment? Well, I was just going to say, the, the net, you made the comment about the real world trust frameworks. Sovereign provides the potential to map real world trust frameworks into the internet. So when we, you go to a restaurant and you ask your friends, is this a good place to eat? There's no reason that that can't be your friends build a trust framework where they just they make claims just by swiping on their phone and say, make a claim, I went to the restaurant, I liked it, it's, it's now a certified claim that's on the, on the network and now you can build an app that'll collect those and, and give you a reputation that says, hey, you know, that's a, that's a good restaurant and I can validate it. Yeah. You could build a completely decentralized Yelp, for example. Yeah, in, anything like that can now be completely decentralized because now you have the, you have the tools to, to build decentralized yeah. Uh, and, that, and that's a great example. Sovereign's not trying to get into the restaurant review business, right? We're just trying to provide the infrastructure such that other people could create a decentralized app for restaurant reviews or what have you. Could you create a decentralized app for things like Uber, Airbnb, Lyft sure. as well? Sure, absolutely, wow. absolutely. And that's one of the things, I, I wrote a blog post a, about two weeks ago about why I believe decentralized identity is the foundation for a decentralized internet. Because there are so many things that we want to do that require identity, and until distributed ledgers came along, we had no way of creating decentralized identity systems. And so even if we wanted to create decentralized applications, if they needed identity, we always had to fall back on some centralized solution. And that's why I think this is really important, because it, it drives decentralization, which I think is critical to human freedom. Yeah. Can you walk us through like the user story? So if I want to make, or so claims are explicit acts by humans, correct? They're not like. They're, they're signed they JSON document. documents. Yeah, there's no reason you can't, I mean, every, every online interaction that you make could be, could generate a claim that would go onto the ledger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me talk through some of the use cases for, because I think that'll, give you some ideas around how this can get used, or at least some of the ways people are thinking about using it right now. So uh, healthcare, we have a, a partner in the UK called Doctors Link. A guy runs it named uh, Manny Najjar. It turns out that in the UK with their national health system, they have a lot of temporary healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, physicians, assistants, etc. These temporary healthcare officials uh, Manny says that they can spend five days a year validating and worrying about their credentials because they show up at a hospital and the hospital says, we need, we need to know you're a neurosurgeon, you have these certain things. And what do they do today? Well, they actually have API integrations to a government agency called GMC and it's costly. It breaks down all the time. If GMC goes down, nobody goes to work. It's, it's a mess. So what Manny wants to do is create a system where all of these credentials are sovereign claims. So when you show up at the hospital, you give them your claim, you give them a proof actually, not the claim as we talked about. Give them a proof that you have all of the requisite um, training and, and certifications that they need. They can check that immediately without talking to anybody and you go to work. So that's, that's one example in healthcare where you could use this. But you could also imagine your entire health record could be a set of claims that, that are collected by you, right? Not by anybody else, because people own claims, right? You own all the claims about you. You, you decide what claims you're going to share with who. Um, BYU, we're um, working on decentralized uh, student systems for recording student learning activities. So a student, Learning activity, what do I mean by that? Could be read a chapter in the textbook, could be completed a quiz, could be uh, participated in a classroom discussion. All of those are learning activities. They could also be claims. And if they're claims, now I can use those in aggregation to say, oh, well, this student deserves to pass this class or this student deserves a degree. 
what, what the reason we're interested in, if you have followed the news out of uh, the LDS Church recently, they announced something called Pathway Worldwide, which is a program to offer higher educational um, learning to members of the LDS Church, 15 million people around the world, 188 countries. So this means that you can take classes from various institutions inside the church education system, and those classes could be aggregated together. We want to do that using a decentralized student learning system that is under the control of the student. Now, there's some practical reasons for putting it under the control of the student. If it's under the control of the student, we have a lot less regulatory burden in 188 countries because right? the student is sharing information about their learning and they have every right to do that. We're not sharing it, we're not collecting it, we're not doing all of that. Um, I should mention, by the way, that this doesn't mean that BYU and the hospitals and other places wouldn't still have accounts for people. Right? They're still obligated to keep all of the information they need to have in order to run their business. BYU is still going to keep track of who takes what classes and what grades they get because that's the business BYU's in. But the student could also have a claim about those things that they could use and share with almost anybody else that, that they want to. Yeah? The thought just occurred to me that like, this would be a panacea to PHI and HIPAA because if the patients own their own medical records and just choose to share those, the details as claims, then there's no risk to any hospital or healthcare provider because they're of a data breach. They'll never be able to lose that patient data because the patient owns the data. Right? Yeah. So there's a so there's a uh, this I this, this kind of system I believe decentralized claims would allow institutions to hold a lot less data about you because they could ask you for it every time you came if you wanted. I mean, it's all automated. These are agents, right? It's not like it's a big deal for you. And now they don't have to hold your credit card because it's easy for them to get your credit card every time you come, right? So now they don't have to worry about a breach losing 143 million social security numbers, for example. Now, Equifax is a completely different story, right? Because they're purely evil, correlating data about you behind your back from the start. But that's OK. It's still a good example. Yeah. Well, and this brings up a question I'm wondering about. There is a lot of value for these corporations in having that data. I mean, there's reliability to them too. But how how are people how are people going to be convinced to either give up that data or take control of it when there are vested interests that want to hold on to it? So, I, I think it's a combination of things. One, you would be surprised how many businesses don't want to hold data about you. Uh, <laughs> we have gotten a lot of interest from banks, for example who have real problems with data that they hold about people, and a lot of it they just assume not hold. Um, now, that doesn't mean they don't want to hold any data about you. Clearly, there are business reasons they need to or want to hold information about you. There are other businesses, right, Equifax, marketing agencies, who their business is holding information about you. Uh, are they going to go away immediately? No, but I, I think that their days are numbered. I think that we're going to, once we build systems that allow people to control their data better, that, that data is going to be a lot less um, easily obtained. Well, I'm thinking about like for health records, for instance. Yeah. Now, we hear the hospital is complaining about their HIPAA requirements, but at the same time, they don't want to give that up because they can sell that data to drug companies for test trials and that sort of thing. It's a profit center. Sure. Yeah, that's a really good point. And then what, what, what prevents the hospital from, let's say you control your own record, you give them a claim saying, you know, my blood pressure is whatever it is, so that they can provide some medical advice. What prevents them from now storing the, the fact that you proved that claim well, in their so, own medical so records? Well, so with consent, consent receipts, you can, with consent receipts, you can automate the terms under which you shared that with. Now, if they say, we want you to share your blood pressure with it, and we're going to sell it to anybody who comes along, and you agree to that, then OK, right? That's, that you agreed to it. But if they say we're not going to, you have a receipt that says they're not going to. And then if they do, you have recourse. Yeah? I've heard of similar things where they're actually trying to, trying to monetize it, right, and give the person a reward. So hey, there's this system set up, and then if I can sell pieces of my data to whether it's an insurance company or a medical yeah. research company. So, or have you baked into this or thought about it? Yeah, so we have actually because um, a lot of claims are valuable. If you think about a, 
a, a university. If you got a degree from BYU and you want to go to grad school at the University of Utah, um, you need to send the University of Utah a transcript. That's not free. We don't just send transcripts to anybody willy-nilly. We're going to charge you money to send the University of Utah a transcript. Actually, we're going to give it to you and you're going to give it to them. But the point is, is you're paying for that because that's something valuable that we believe we, we should get recompensed for. Credit reporting agencies is another example. What right? when, reverse, though? What's that? What about the reverse, where I hold my medical data and, and a company? Well, so, so stand by. I'm getting there. Okay. So the credit reporting agencies are another example of somebody who compiles a lot of interesting information, believes it's valuable, and now when somebody else wants it, they want to get paid for it. So Sovereign has built in the notion of something called a premium claim, which is a claim that has value associated with it and money that gets transferred when that claim is either given to the owner or when that claim is verified by the verifier. Now, that system can provide money back to the owner depending on how the claim is set up. So you could, you could set up a system whereby owners get Rick some kind of monetary reward when they share claims of certain information. Are those receipts, those consent receipts, like legacy legal system first, or can you uh, put that in like the rate in network on Ethereum in a smart contract so that you can automate that. Uh, Good question. Because then um, rate network, I don't you can set up an API, and if someone wants to call from it, they have to pay a small microtransaction, and you can do that really yeah. seamlessly. Uh, so, so I don't know about consent receipts, but that's what we're building into Sovereign around claims is that kind of system. Okay. I apologize if I'm being. Um, difficult, but I don't understand how a consent receipt prevents someone from, like, let's say you... It doesn't prevent them from doing anything. It yeah. gives you a record of what they agreed to so that you can hold them accountable. But what if they sell that data that you prove that claim? Like, let's say you prove that your income is over X because you wanted a loan, right? Um, then your bank decides to sell that data that, hey, we know his income is over X to another bank who wants to use it to market you know, credit cards to you. How do you know, how would you prove that third party bank actually, or the first one that you can you know, send a consent receipt to didn't you know, do something untrustworthy with your data? You probably can't prove that individually, but banks are unlikely to do that if they know that they have all of these records out there because once it is discovered, they'll have huge liability around it. I'm just imagining yeah. that, I mean, there are- You're, you're not gonna prevent, yeah. I mean, the point is you're not gonna prevent evil people from doing evil things, right? But you are going to prevent people who are afraid of the liability and risk that they would entail because they know they can be held accountable from doing stupid things. Right? Their lawyers won't let them. It's better than the system we have now. Blanket data collection. Yeah, but the, the challenge is that there's all these advertising analytics companies that make a, their whole business is like, you know, like Experian or whatever is one example, but there's other, you know, like Google, that are, their whole business is collecting all this data about you and like aggregating it into forms that they can use to, to market to you. And, and I can't imagine that these guys wouldn't do whatever possible to get right. And I can't, and I can't, and I can't force Google to change how they do things. But what I can do is provide an alternative that provides more privacy and let people choose. Right. At the very least, you're only revealing the, that one piece of item that you chose. That's true. Yeah. It's not your entire You're not actually revealing the possibility of that thing. Yeah. The only thing. Yeah. The only thing they have is a proof that you're over 18. So now they know that, but they don't know everything about you. Right. So. So, like I said, I can't, I can't change what Google does, but I can give you an alternative that says, oh, I don't need to share all that information with them. I could do something else. Right. You significantly reduce the, mod the monetization value of the data that you're sharing with the company. It's less specific, and so they have to work a lot harder, and so that there's an economic disincentive that you do, you know. And so it, it, changes, it, it, it changes things significantly. That's true. Um, disadvantaged populations, there are um, almost a billion or over a billion underdocumented people in the world. Not just refugees, but people who don't have any legal identity just because of where they were born uh, or things that were lost. These people don't have access to banking, they don't have access to health care. Uh, we have a partner called iRespond who is using biometrics uh, and writing data onto Sovereign 
in order to um, immunize, vaccinate uh, people in Africa and Asia. So when these people come into the clinic, they have no record of who they are. So they use biometric data to establish who they are. And then they can look up using, they, they never write the biometric data to the ledger, but they can use that to figure out what the DID is. Then they can look up the person, they can find their records, and they can say, oh, you got this immunization three months ago. If we gave you this other one, it would be dangerous right now, so let's not do that. Right? They, they essentially promiscuously inoculate people as they come into clinics just because they don't know when they're going to see them next. And this gives them a way of, of providing that, that data. So that's just one example. Yeah. You know, just one quick question I had as you were describing this was, uh, I was curious, as you probably imagine, a lot of people here are interested in other potential blockchains where a service like Sovereign could be made available. And I'm just curious about how <coughs> abstract the choice of blockchain is in your code base and how, eas how easily someone could plug and play another compatible blockchain with uh, Sovereign. Sam, question. Uh, comment yes. on that? Yeah, uh, so, so the DID, verifiable claim stack, Uport, which is part of consensus, is building for the Ethereum ecosystem, and a company called Blockstack is also using DIDs for the Bitcoin ecosystem. Okay. So they're, they're, they're quickly, and if you go to the Internet Identity Workshop, there's a lot of people in that space that are working to try to use a lot of the standards that, that are really coming out of Sovereign, but are being put out as, as open standards that other people can use. Yeah, so we're looking for interoperability with those. I mean, I don't believe that there's going to be one blockchain-based identity system, at least not uh, right off, because I think there's going to be a lot of different reasons people use different ones. Right. Now, I happen to believe that Sovereign has the advantage on privacy. Oh, okay. Right, because a system that charges you to write identifiers means that you're going to be reluctant to create a thousand of them or two thousand right. of them or whatever you need in order to prevent correlation. And I see that as a really strong advantage right now, but I think that as this as blockchains mature that it may become slightly less of an advantage. Yeah, and Sovereign's consensus algorithm can be changed out without changing the, uh, the stuff on top. And so if that happens, we could move to a permissionless model without changing anything else about Sovereign. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Just sort of related to that, I was just curious what your personal incentive structure was. Like, does the foundation have patents, or uh, how do you how do you stay afloat and you know self interested? Um, so, my personal incentive structure is I want the world to have a decentralized identity platform. So, by our bylaws, no trustee and sovereign can be paid for their service. Um, so I have no financial incentive to do this. Phil's been doing this for like half of his life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, how does the foundation come af stay afloat? I just put a blog post up this week about independence and self-sustainability for Sovereign. And um, I also just mentioned a minute ago premium claims and the fact that some portion of that premium claim fee could go to the owner. Some portion of it could also go to the foundation. So the foundation has a built-in sustainability model based on the idea of premium claims. That's not up and running yet, so the foundation isn't like rolling in dough, but that, that's our plan, right? Our plan is to create a system that is self-sustainable because it doesn't do us any good to create an identity system if we have to go to the Googles and the Microsofts and the Facebooks and the Amazons of the world and beg them for money because they're not going to give us the money we need or they're going to give it with strings attached. Right? So the only way we can build a decentralized public identity system that is independent is to have a self-sustainability model and premium claims gives us that. Why wouldn't they just compete with you? What's that? Why wouldn't they just compete with you? They're welcome to. I don't think they can match what we're doing. I mean, they've been running, they've been running, their, they've been running their own um, login systems, right? Social login. Uh, for five or six years now, and banks aren't going to use them. Healthcare isn't going to use them. They've kind of reached the, the limit of the kinds of use cases that social login is going to be used for. So I, I think decentralized identity based on distributed ledgers is the next model. They do have the difference is, the, the difference is those are all centralized systems. All the OAuth. They're all centralized and controlled. Google and Facebook and Amazon, they're all centralized identity providers where this is a completely decentralized system. 
and they also have no incentive. So, 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 here's, so here's the answer I would give you. Why did the internet beat CompuServe? Google's CompuServe, sovereign is the internet when it comes to identity. Because anybody can use sovereign for anything they want. Um, this kind of gets to, um, to some of the, the stuff I was going to say at the end. But I believe that what the internet gave us was a global public communication system that allowed anybody to use it for anything that they saw fit. CompuServe only allowed people to use CompuServe for what they, what CompuServe wanted them to do. They had a profit motive, so they didn't want to allow competitors to use it. If you're a competitor to Google, why would you use them? You're not going to. You're going to set your own thing up, and you're just going to fragment more and more. When a global identity system comes along that's decentralized and allow anybody to build any kind of trust framework on top of it that they want, that's where people are going to migrate. That's my belief. So I'm not, I'm not worried about competing with Google, Amazon, Facebook, and, um, and uh, the, the like in terms of identity. Now, we know we're not competing with them in terms of what they do for a business, but we are competing with them for identity, and I believe we'll win. Yeah. Until these identity services are interoperable, it seems like the key is going to be a large network, right? A network effect. So, so what is the plan to get enough people using it to have a critical mass where... Yeah, so there's an interesting story around that, and I've got this financial institution picture up there at the top. So about um, 21 months ago, when I first heard about this system, that was exactly my question, and how are you ever going to get anybody to use it? And Timothy Ruff, who's the CEO of Evernim, which is the company that developed all of this and then spun it off into the Sovereign Foundation, he said, come to Denver next week. I said, you're crazy. I'm not flying to Denver next week. And he says, no, you've got to come to Denver next week. So I flew to Denver. He had a hotel room, probably about three times the size of this room, full of those round tables. And every table, every seat at every table was full of someone from a credit union. And you would have thought you were at an evangelical meeting with these people <laughs> raising their hand and saying, I believe. I believe in blockchain. I believe in distributed ledgers. I'm thinking, these are credit unions. <laughs> they are excited about this. So we have a number of credit unions who are involved. We have USAA. We have some other financial institutions who, when, I, when we announce them, you will go, wow. Um, these are big players. They don't want to use Facebook's login. They want to use Sovereign's login. Now, why do they want to use Sovereign's login? Well, because they don't want to use Facebook's login, and they know they can't do it on their own. Right? They're, they're happy to use a decentralized public system over being beholden to somebody like Facebook. So the financial institutions are one of the places that's going to drive this. And once they start signing people up, then those people will have Sovereign on their phone and they'll be able to use it at the next place and the next place and the next place. And the same app, just like a browser, could be used to go to 100 different websites. The same Sovereign app can be used to log into 1,000 different places. That's what will drive the network effects. Carl? I'm curious about, um, you know, uh, just to set up this question, um, Stripe really revolutionized how easy it was to integrate payments onto people's yeah. websites. In a similar way, I'm curious as to how much effort you put into making it easy for developers to um, set up authentication. Using well, not software. enough yet. Okay. But that's where that's our goal, right? Is to is to make it easy for everybody to do. Uh, so, so let me talk about where things are. Uh, July 31st, we launched the provisional <coughs> network. So if you if you have um, if you haven't listened to it. Go to Radio Lab and download the podcast called The Ceremony. It's a podcast about the launch ceremony of the Zcash network. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's a very, very cool podcast. We also had a launch ceremony. Ours was not nearly as um, involved as Zcash. Uh, but we had a launch ceremony where we wrote keys and we created the genesis blocks for the ledger and we got all of the validators on the phone and they all uh, you know, uh, came to consensus and we recorded it so that we can have it 
out in public and everybody can see how the sovereign ledger was started. So if they have any questions about, you know, were, were things written into it at the start. So the sovereign <coughs> ledger is live now in what we call provisional mode. Provisional because it doesn't have all of the features on it. It doesn't have easy ways for developers to just integrate it into their website, for example. So there's still a lot of work to do. We believe that we will achieve general availability before the end of the year. Uh, we believe that we're probably about a year out from having premium claims that work and can, can, uh, can handle the transactions around val valuable claims. What currency are you going to use for that, to, to pay that premium claims? ICO. I didn't. Um, An ICO? A sovereign token. Which doesn't exist? Doesn't exist yet. So um, I'm not announcing are, are anything. I'm not announcing <laughs> anything, by the way. <laughs> but if you were going to do this, right? Just hypothetically speaking, if you were going to do this, what would you do, right? You would, you would create some kind of cryptocurrency, right? This is probably what you would do. I'm not announcing anything, but if you just think it through, that's probably so what you would do. You're not going to approach it from like collecting fiat to begin with. The, the what? For the premium claims, your first, um, your first uh, feature out of the gate is going to accept cryptocurrency. As a, as the yeah, so it turns out that one of the problems with premium claims is if you try to exchange value around a claim, you destroy the privacy preserving properties of the zero knowledge proof. Mm -hmm. And so you have to do something special to make, to keep them private as you exchange value. And that means you can't just like have people put in Visa cards or uh, ERC-20 token or right. Ether or something else. You have to do something special in the system to make it all work and preserve privacy. So you have to change the system to make it work, which is why there's a sovereign, an idea of a sovereign token. Okay. So it strikes me that um, it seems like the, the uh, main value prop of sovereign, and I could be wrong, so please correct me, is that you're keeping a distributed ledger of entities' public keys, and then those public keys can be used to sign any type of transaction or to sign any type of proof of claim. Well, that and an entire code base built on top of it, which allows you to easily exchange verifiable claims and verify them. Okay, so that's so the reason I ask that is because it sound it almost sounds a little bit like Keybase.io if you've ever looked at that. Basically, mm -hmm. a big ledger of people's you know PGP keys, public yeah. keys, right? such that you could go to the ledger and trust that that person is who they say they are or, or decrypt a message that was encrypted with their private key yep. that they sent to you. But so what you're adding on top of something like that is not only the decentralization, because Keybase is centralized by the company that owns it, I guess, but you're adding the ability to verify those proofs yeah. on top of it. Okay. Yeah, all of the code that, that allows you to do that. To make the proofs as well, right? Yeah. And verify. I mean, so the... So the <laughs> So, so earlier I said that you could change out the consensus protocol, which is called Plenum. Right? If you go look at Hyperledger Indy, you'll see Plenum in there, and that's, that's the consensus protocol. What is it called? Plenum, uh, Hyperledger Indy project. Um, so and earlier I said you could change that out for some other ledger system, and Sovereign would keep working. What does that mean? It means that all of the code on top of that would still know what to do. Right? There's an abstraction layer there. So, so the distributed ledger is important. But there's a whole set of functionality on top of that, which is built and available and, and you can use. I mean, in some ways, think about how TCPIP works, right? I mean, you could just say, well, you know, we've got Ethernet, okay, and we've got IP, okay, and then, you know, you've got this whole stack of technologies which eventually get you up to, oh, we can exchange HTTP messages and so on, right? So it's this whole stack that's the value proposition. Yeah. How many validators do you have currently? And what's the target for when you do We have about a dozen, maybe a few more. There's probably another dozen who are in process. Um, when the network is fully functional and serving a billion people, we think we'd probably need about 200. So not a huge number. Is there a limit to how many you'll accept just because you want to keep it scalable? Um, there's, a, there's a communication overhead as you add a whole bunch more. And so we probably would never have, say, 20,000. OK. So there, there is, now that, that also depends on underlying technology, and this technology is changing a lot, right? I mean, there's, there's new developments all the time. So that's the current thinking based on where we're at right now. 
in two years, maybe it'll all be different, right? It could you be have minimum service level. Yep. Uh, that you, that yeah, there's minimum service levels. It's all monitored. They mm -hmm. monitor each other essentially. It's a, it's cool. a, it's a pretty sophisticated distributed network of, of nodes. You said earlier that they're permission. They're public, but they're permissioned. And does that mean that you're not going to allow just you know Joe nobody in his basement to run a validator node? It That's has right. To be like a trusted institution. That's right. Now there's another notion called observer nodes. And we may allow Joe Nobody in his basement to run an observer node that hasn't been decided yet. And those would just keep the so node observer node nodes can read, but they can't write to the I ledger. It would mostly be the incentive would be that you want to be you want to know as soon as possible what's happening on the blockchain. Yeah, right? so I, I see. So the idea is to keep the blockchain from basically becoming a dumping ground for data that you just shouldn't be there, right? If it's well, yeah. I mean, you want. Con I mean, they're not. They're not actually looking at what's in the transactions and making decisions about what to allow or what and what not to allow. They're just achieving consensus on the transactions. That's all they're doing. Sam, you have. I was say, one, one, there's active discussion. I'm on the technical governance. Board. Yeah, Sam's on. The, and I should have mentioned that Sam's on the sovereign technical governance. Board. You seem really informed. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so, so one of the one of the discussions is that allow the observer nodes to be metricized so that they could compete to become validator nodes in the event that a validator node goes offline or, or, or proves not to be a, a reliable validator node. Yeah. Yeah. You can imagine a a whole slew of nodes, some of them are doing validation, and the ones that are doing validation are essentially being selected by some algorithm that's being run by all of the nodes. We're not doing that right now, but you could imagine that happening, and that would be a, a fairly interesting system. But yeah? There's no economic barrier to, to creating one, or requesting one of these DIDs, whatever they're called. How do you prevent you know, spamming and DDoS attacks? I mean, that could be yeah, so, so they, um, mm -hmm. the current thinking is one of two things. One is to allow essentially introductions. So you can create a DID if, if you have been introduced by somebody else who has a DID. And then limiting from, from a time perspective, you can only do that once every so often, right? Um, so, so that's one idea. Another idea is to use the same you know, tokens that you're using for premium claims and to charge some small amount for the DID, which then maybe even gets refunded later if the, if the process was, you know, if it wasn't spam, for example. There are a lot of different ways you could do that, but yeah, you have to have a, some way of preventing uh, DDoS attacks of just spamming the ledger. Follow yeah. up on that, um, if I'm a self-driving car and I own myself, yep. I have a Bitcoin wallet, Pay tow trucks. Can I create a DID, or can I be sovereign? Or if I'm a so so right now, if you go to sovereign.org/trust-framework, you will see three documents. You will see the trust framework, which is a, like a 30-page document that has all kinds of terms defined and everything else. You will see a steward agreement, which essentially is what the steward signed that says we will abide by the trust framework. That's basically what it says. See an identity owner agreement. Well, you look at the trust framework, you'll see that right now Sovereign does not allow non-people or non-entities, right? So, you, so organizations and people can own DIDs, but things can get a DID, but only if their person gives them one. So right now, no, you couldn't. But I imagine that if that becomes a thing that is important, that could certainly change. And that's Sovereign.com forward slash Sovereign.org slash trust dash framework. And also, if you go to Sovereign.org, there's a library link. And the library has all kinds of white papers with lots of detail about this. If you go to my blog, windley.com, and look on the Sovereign tag just over on the right, just click on Sovereign, you'll see all of the blog articles I've written about this. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of information out there. Yeah, Carl. Yeah, um, so I was wondering a little bit about um, It'll come back. Sorry. Okay, that's all right. Are yeah. you actively going out to people who we trust with claims right now, like DMVs? Or is that, are you so Illinois, the state of Illinois, just announced last week that they will start writing birth registrations to the sovereign ledger. Mm -hmm. So that's the first government entity to fall, and I think that there will be many more. And are, you mentioned you do a lot of speeches over here. Are you talking to a lot of 
financial institutions as well? Talk talked to a lot of financial institutions. I talk in Europe quite a bit. Been there three times this year. Uh, I was at my data in Finland last week, and um, Sovereign was part of almost every session. Somebody was talking about Sovereign. Not because we orchestrated that, but just because it was um, important. Uh, Finland just announced, we just, we just had a press release come out today that there's a thing called Trustnet in Finland, which is essentially a government organized group of universities and others who are going to be exploring how self-sovereign identity um, helps people own and control their personal data, and that is based on sovereign. So there's a whole uh, set of self-sovereign identity people in Finland who are using this. So, so we, we are starting to see um, government entities and others fo you know, follow on with, with this idea and, why, and, and, and starting to use it. Yeah, Carl. Yeah, so observer nodes, um, this idea of observer nodes, if you don't have that, I guess what I'm wondering is um, the people that are making the claims and then verifying the claims, don't they have to have data from the blockchain somehow? And if so, how much data do they need? And how do they get so, that? So data? tell me exactly what you mean. Part of what I'm wondering is if if I, as someone who wants to create a claim or a DID or, and, or verify one, if I don't actually, if I'm not a node on that blockchain, how do I get the Oh, you, that's why agents exist. Agents. So you'll have a relationship with your own personal agent, and your agent is the, is the system that's going to, that's what you're going to use to say, oh, I want to share the fact that I'm over 18 with Walmart's pharmacy. And the agent knows how to do that, right? And the software the agent, will... Is the agent a node on the blockchain? No, doesn't have to be. Many agencies will have nodes on the blockchain, but they won't all. But how they will know, agents? but agent software will know how to talk to nodes. It knows somehow. Yeah. That's, what, that's built into the sovereign code is how to, how to send a message. It's a gossip protocol, right? They'll know how to send a message to the network and get back information. And if I could ask one I mean, follow up. Say, I mean, let, me, let, me, let me follow up on that for just a second. You don't have to be running a router in a peer uh, center on the internet in order to make a DNS request. Mm -hmm. You just have to know how to talk to the router, right? That's what right. you have to know. And so that's the same thing, is your agent knows how to talk to nodes on the network and get information. So you had yeah. a follow-up? And my follow-up was, um, if I want to use Sovereign, but I also have some sort of app that relies on another blockchain, so I have some kind of hybrid app that is talking to Sovereign for identity-related things, but then some other blockchain for other things that it does, can you see any reason why that wouldn't work? Or no. No, in fact, the, your, your app would just be able to use Sovereign. Yeah. You, can write, you can write apps that you would use Sovereign and be able to do that. So that, that's all, I mean, that, that's exactly what we want to have happen. In fact, one of the reasons why Hyperledger was interested in having Sovereign join and contribute to code for Project Indy is because they have, you know, four, four ledgers? Three? Anyway, they have a, a handful of ledgers. And all of these ledgers had an identity problem, and none of them wanted to spend the next two years solving the identity problem so they could do something, right? So the whole idea of Sovereign is that you can use it inside other things like other distributed ledgers. Yeah, I mean, I see that as one of the biggest problems right now in the blockchain space is that in order to just do this one little thing that you want to do, you have to like reinvent or invent, actually, all these things that currently exist in a, deep, in a not centralized Yeah, system. Sovereign's trying to be an identity system, and that's all we want to be. Yeah. And we don't want to be everything else. And so we don't have any, we, we don't want to give anybody any reason why they wouldn't want to just use Sovereign if they need identity. Good, let's use it. Uh, so that, that's our goal. Yeah. Well, uh, it looks like, like on the press release for the Illinois birth certificates, Evernames was pretty present. What's the relationship between Evernames and Sovereign and why the two so, entities? So Evernim developed all of this technology and um, became convinced uh, through discussions with me and others that they couldn't do it as a private company and have people trust it. So they essentially gave Sovereign to the Sovereign Foundation and all of the relationships, the network is, is overseen by the Sovereign Foundation, not Evernim. So Evernim is like a general contractor 
on the sovereign network, right? They're helping build out a lot of stuff. They clearly have a lot of the people who know how it works. They're uh, an important part of the sovereign ecosystem, but they aren't sovereign. Uh, so when Illinois wants to be able to write birth registrations, they need help. They're going to go to a company like Evernim who knows how sovereign works and ask them to do that. But Evernim doesn't have any um, special place. Anybody could become a sovereign, uh, a company that works with sovereign and writes and helps Illinois or Utah or whoever do this. If there was an ICO, is it sovereign or Evernim? Or how does, how does Evernim make money? Why would they? Well, Evernim makes money by uh, charging people for the work that they do. They're the and integrator. They're just the integrator. And, and they're, for, an, they're an agency. And so for so products, right? They're an agency, so they run they agents. They provide identity as a service through their agency. It's yeah. just that under the hood, it's sovereign. Yeah, so when, so when USAA rolls out Sovereign for their uh, members, right? the USA is a bank, when they roll out Sovereign for their members, yeah, Evernim is going to be the company that builds that for them, right? They're, they have people internally who do stuff, but Evernim is going to supply them with products that allow them to do that. So Evernim is selling products around Sovereign. Um, so that's, that's the relationship. So um, the Sovereign Board of Trustees has two people who work for Evernim, but everybody else is independent of 12. Right? So Evernim does not have control of Sovereign in that sense. Is Sovereign open source? Yes. Go to hyperledger.org slash indie and yeah. you'll see yeah, all the sources there. It's all on GitHub. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, so I have this wallet called Jax on my smartphone. Uh -huh. It has like $100 of Bitcoin. If someone hacked it, uh, they could get my private key off my smartphone and steal my Bitcoin, right? Yep. Um, so if your identity is tied to your private key and it's sitting on your smart devices and malware sat on your devices and sniffed the private key, would you, wouldn't you have problems with... Uh, so if you're using a Bitcoin wallet, this is general advice, that is not writing private keys into the secure enclave on your phone, you should get a different wallet. Right, but they recently found that even though... Jax does that. Yeah, it's still vulnerable because the private key is on your device. It's not air gapped like this. This is a hardware sure. wallet, and the private key is offline. Sure, right? sure. But I mean, for identity stuff, your keys are probably going to be on your phone, and it has to be built right. I mean, Apple, Apple, and Android both put private keys on the phone, and they believe they're secure enclaves or is capable of, of, of. Um, protecting them when it's done right. So I, I think there are solutions to that problem. We're not going to, it's, un, it's unlikely that most people are going to be willing to carry around a hardware key that they plug into their phone whenever they want to log into a website. I mean, we have that now, right? And we have uh, UV keys and other things, and most people won't use them. So a lot of the same technology that's used for Bitcoin wallets can be used for, for these keys. So for example, you can use a in fact, one of the standards that Sovereign is fostered is, is uh, a hard to determine the keychain standard that they've adapted to work with uh, the 255.19 keys, which are nonlinear, um, which, which, which helps. But in that case, then, you could have the keys that you actually use for transactions that are on your phone, but your root key is error gap. So, so if you're using best practices and only using a key per attribute or claim, even if somebody steals some of the keys, they don't have your root key, they don't have your whole identity, you can, you, you know, you, you have, it's, it's not like getting your, your, your Bitcoin, you know, key right. because you, yeah. you, you decentralize your identity, so your identity is, is, is already diffuse, so, so, so yeah. the exposure is much smaller, and it is, you know, not your money, it, it, so it is, you know, it's your age. You know, well, your age. when you use your uh, ID, so what you said isn't grandmother friendly, right? Yet. No. Um, it's not. And I wouldn't put million dollars on my Jack's wallet on my smartphone. And personally, I wouldn't put my ID on. What did you call it? I wouldn't put my private. Yeah, I, I wouldn't do that either because my ID is hooked to my bank account. It's hooked to. 
my medical records is hooked to no, things no, no, that are no, no. literally. You're, you're saying you have one ID. I, my ID is valuable. That's no, no, all no, I'm no. saying. You don't have one ID with the sovereign. That's the whole point. You got a right. thousand you have IDs. An ID graph. So every different bank account, every different interaction has a different identifier. Yeah. yeah. Right, but it's, no it's, 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 ID. Isn't there your concept of ID one? is this single legal identifier. Decentralized identifier says your ID is a diffuse cloud of identifiers. Okay, but if, if they, they get my like private key, private though. Key? There's yes. not one private key, though. There's a private key for every one of those identifiers. Yes, You've yeah. got thousands of private keys. Yeah. Decentralized. But they're all on your smart device, right? They don't all have to be on the same smart device. They don't all have so to be attached to the same agent. And like, and like Sam just said, the root key can be air-gapped. So how would you make that frictionless for a grandmother? And to follow up to that, if someone solved that problem, which is one of the biggest problems right now, uh, the user interface problem with private keys. If someone solved that, would you just use their solution? Sure. Sure, absolutely. Sure, we, we, we'll use whatever the if best solution, solution is. If you that, you're welcome to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like fractals with yeah, but each one of them. Yeah. You know what this yeah. reminds me of too is, um, if any of you have used 1Password, they have this travel mode, and they have this notion of vaults where you can say, well, these particular pieces of um, passwords or private information I store in this vault that has a certain level of security, but when I'm traveling, I only want to share these lower, you know, risk items. And so in a similar way, like you could determine that certain DIDs are very privileged information that you don't want to store on your mobile device, but you, yeah. you know, if there's something that's less sensitive, maybe you feel comfortable with. I hope you don't put your private keys for Bitcoin in, in one <laughs> password. <laughs> you don't, right? Because, <laughs> like, well, you, you might put your password that's scary. to your wallet, but then your I, wallet itself is stored uh, you know, offline or yeah. something, right? Yeah. See, no, but, but on the other hand, nobody has access to that information if they don't have my master password, right? So. But it's still, your private, the, the password is on your smartphone, right? It's uh, not air gapped. So I think what you were saying earlier, though, is like you have this central root of trust, right? The, the root private key that can sign all these sub keys, essentially. And if the sub keys that were on my mobile device, if my mobile device gets lost, I could revoke those sub keys and generate new ones from my air gapped root of trust. That's right. And so you're yeah. only exposed for, for a short amount of time. Right. And there's no honeypot. Understand now, unlike Equifax, there's a honeypot. There's a reason for people to ex go to extreme measures to get those identifiers. They're just going to get you, and unless you're worth billions of dollars, what are they going to yeah, get? Yeah, so, so if you've got a million dollars of Bitcoin, you probably are going to be smart enough to take special precautions around how you protect the keys right. associated and with that. Just, Same thing's true of other important keys associated with it. If your grandma has a million dollars of Bitcoin, then she can either, she either has to learn about that or she has to pay somebody to help her with it. Because, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't help high-target individuals not be targets if they don't do the stuff that they need to do. But for most of us, right, for 99.999% for of the population, what we've described here is orders of magnitude better than what they're doing right now. Um, and worrying about whether someone's going to break into my wife's cell phone and steal her private keys is, I mean, I've got a lot of worries bigger than that right now because she's using the same password for, you know, half of the site she goes to. So, so the, I mean, it's, it's all relative to, to where you're at. And, you know, if you've got a million dollars of Bitcoin, yeah, don't put your private key that protects that account in Sovereign. Don't do it. But let me also add, having lost over a million dollars of Bitcoin already, <laughs> that um, I actually think that you're more vulnerable to data loss than you are to theft as long as you reasonably protect your private keys. And you're better off storing hard copy duplicates of your key in some safe, safe place, like I have in a safe deposit box, you know, so. Just just a little tip. Which, which bank is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. under the pillow. The challenge, though, and I think it brings up a really good point, the challenge is key recovery in the event of a lost device or a lost root device. That becomes a real challenge because it's almost like what happens if, you're, if your house burns down and all your passports and birth certificates and driver's licenses are in there. Now you have to go to the government and prove right. you are 
a legitimate person again, right? It's kind of a hard Yeah, so key, re re key recovery is one of the big issues here. And, you know, sharded key recovery uh, mechanisms are, are part of what we're building into Sovereign. So Yeah, I'm actually paranoid about these little uh, Trezor hardware devices, right? These, uh, because I actually think, you know, you're carrying that with you everywhere. You could easily accidentally drop it on the ground and it could get run over, right? And great, like no one can get it, but neither can you, right? So well, you but some of them have a mnemonic, mnemonic code that you can keep it someplace you can read. People buy two deposit read. box, right? And then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. but anyway, yeah. just I mean, these are great, box. great points. Very they're very just right. something to think about as you're, you know, as you're. So, um, so sovereign is not solving the key that's, management that's problem. Right. Right. That's what. Sovereign, solving the identity problem. And the key management problem is an affiliated problem that needs to be solved. That there are a lot of people yeah. working on, right? There's a lot of people with bigger interests than sovereign working on key management. Significantly, you know, the economic incentive just isn't there, like you said, anymore for someone. To, it would take some serious resources to be able to to hack or to to, to mess with something that was valuable, and it's just not. Well, I believe that we will be sovereign in the future, like your home. If it's worth a million dollars, it will be under your identity. It won't be under in a government registry office. So like when we talk about identity, we're talking about real net worth here. So it's not something to take lightly. I believe it's one and the same problem. So So um, before we continue with further with our discussion, um, for those who maybe need to leave, and I'll respect Phil's time if you need to go as well, I just want to thank Phil for coming out and sharing the, uh, all this information about sovereignty. Well, thanks. You guys have been a great audience. I, I appreciate all the discussion and all of the good questions because this is the best discussion I've had uh, with any audience. So you guys are, are uh, on top of the list. Thanks. Yeah, so thanks. thanks for coming out. Yeah. So, so, so the last thing is just, um, that's me, uh, at Windley on Twitter, windley.com. Um, like I said, I blog a lot about Sovereign and other decentralized topics. So feel free to engage me, talk to me, ask questions, whatever. So, thanks. How do you get a room of blockchain fanatics worked up? You talk about managing private keys. <laughs> <laughs>